that's able to make it out. And we'll just open up in a word of prayer. Lord, thank you for letting us be in your house. Thank you for the technology. Thank you for your word. And Lord, I just want to ask tonight that you will just bless each one and just help us to be obedient unto you. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, go ahead and get your Bibles. We're going to be in Proverbs 22, and we'll continue on. And I'll try to make sure and keep a check on time as to how far we can get. I'd like to get through the chapter, but we'll just see how that works out. May or may not be able to make it all the way through. <clears throat> I'm going to ask the Lord's blessing over uh, the teaching, preaching tonight. And we'll get right in. We're going to start in verse 6. That's where we left off last week. Lord, thank you again for letting us gather together. Thank you for your word. And God, I pray that you'll just help us as we look into your word, that we draw out what you want us to see and that we'll apply it to our lives. Be with every church that's preaching truth tonight. Be with them. God, God I pray that you'll just uh, use them for uh, your will. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, verse number 6. We're going to dive right in. Uh, a verse you know very well, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. <laughs> this verse uh, we've uh, no doubt spoken of several times, looking at different things, looking at the family in particular, but I do want to give it a little bit of attention this evening because uh, it's ever so needed in the day we live. I know most of you, your children are grown, they've left home, um, and but you have grandchildren that are around. And then I have children here that are still under my care. And it's, it's a subject we need to spend a, just a few minutes on here and train up a child. And if you do a little word study there, uh, train up a child, the words used there means to dedicate and to train. So dedicate your child, dedicate yourself to train them, dedicate them to, uh, uh, to the Lord to, be, uh, uh, to follow him and to, to follow his direction and teach them in the way they should go. Uh, the way they should go means their journey, their course of life, the steps they're going to take, the path they're going to follow. It is up to the father and the mother to train a child. Uh, the Lord gives children, uh, I believe they're a gift from God, and we should, as mothers and fathers, train them, teach them how to live life. And uh, just practically speaking, teach them how to live in this world. Teach them the things they need to know, the things they need to, uh, to advance in life, the things they need to avoid, how to interact, how to speak to others, how to work. And then I stress that the word of God tells us to train them up in the way he should go, in the way he should go. Not necessarily what we choose for them, not necessarily uh, the, uh, the career maybe we want them to, to, to follow or the, the things we want them to follow in life. Uh, but yes, we should train them up in the word of God. We should train them up to know the goodness of God. We should share the gospel with them in hopes that they are saved and guide them towards doing right. And doing so, when we do that, we teach them to follow the Lord. And when they trust Christ as Savior and grow in him, they will know to follow him. They will see that from the training we've given them, from the life we've lived before them. And I stress that as well as an important factor in our children. We need to live the life in front of them that we want them to, to follow, that we, the, the right type of life, how we interact with other people, how we handle disappointments, how we handle obstacles, how we uh, handle good things in life. And the, the way we react will teach them how to react as well. Many times parents, though, they want to push their children down the career path they want for them. Some parents will even try to live out what they missed in life or the things they wanted to do in life that they didn't, and they'll try to live it out through their children. That's not what this text is teaching us. It's simply saying, train up your children in the wisdom of God, train them up in the way they should go, following the Lord and to trust him. And when they're saved, keep training them and teaching them to follow the Lord. But as a parent, guide them and then allow the Lord to take over. Allow the Lord to begin to guide them and you've done enough teaching to them that they know to follow the Lord, that they know to go in the direction he wants them to go. And when they're old, uh, they will not depart from it. Now, I understand not all children will put their faith in Christ and stay in his way. That's their choice. We're to do everything we can to teach them right, but ultimately it's their choice for their eternity. It's their choice if they're going to stay and follow the Lord. But this doesn't change the principle of this teaching. It's up to the parent to do their part according to the word of God. 
the child may depart, but it is instilled in them. They will always know truth if we give them the truth, if we instill the truth in them. They will always know how to uh, live a, a, a correct life if we teach them. They may choose not to, but it will be inside them. It'll not depart from them. It will be within them. The child will make their own choices, but we must do our best to train them and teach them right. Uh, you, you, there's multiple examples in, in everyday life, but out in scripture as well, of children that did depart, but they came back because it was instilled in them and they knew uh, the right way to go. So now verse number seven. The rich ruleth over the poor, and the borrower is servant to the lender. We saw back in verse 2 <coughs> that God dealt with the rich and the poor in that verse, that he was no respecter of persons. He made the rich, he made the poor, and we know in every day, economically speaking, though, those who have more financially have an advantage over the person that has less. It's just a practical economic truth, and this is explaining that somewhat. Uh, and so it's a it's a good truth lesson. Now let me explain some of this. Let me read the verse again. The rich ruleth over the poor, and the borrower is servant to the lender. Now think about this: when you go buy a house or you go buy a car, that's a, that's a big purchase. It's something that most of us cannot take cash money and pay for. We have to finance it, take out a loan. And when we do that, we have debt unto the one we borrow from, the one who had more money, the rich, the one who had the money to lend us. We have now become obligated to under that lender. They have something over you. And if you miss out on that payment, they can take whatever you've borrowed to buy. If you miss your payment on your vehicle, that one that loans you that money, they're going to take that vehicle. If you miss the payments on your house, they're going to take your house. It's good to not have to borrow. It's better when we do not have debt under someone else, but that's not always the case in the day we live. Things are so expensive. And so the key mention, uh, the key here, I believe what uh, Solomon is trying to tell us when he says the rich ruleth over the poor and the borrower is a servant of the lender is he's teaching us as those that may have to borrow not to overspend. Do not go in debt over and above what you know you can pay. Think it out. I know I can pay this amount back and don't overdo it. Don't continuously use credit because you'll get in over your head. You'll become servant unto that lender. Uh, and will be enslaved unto that debt. Verse number eight, he that soweth iniquity shall reap vanity and the rod of his anger shall fail. Those who sow iniquity, they're gonna reap vanity. Again, we've, loaded, we've said several times in the Proverbs, you reap what you sow. Vanity, it can mean emptiness and we can apply that to say iniquity will never bring you any gain. But if you do a little word study here, this word vanity is the word aven, meaning sorrow and trouble. You will, again, reap what you sow. You'll not have positive gain from doing iniquity in your life. It'll eventually bring trouble, and it'll leave you empty. The rot hit, the, their rod of anger shall fail. Their power to continue in their ways and their wicked ways, it's going to run out. It's going to catch up with them one day. And another application here, living in iniquity will never produce anything of value in your life. Never, and you will fall. Verse number nine. He that hath a bountiful eye, <coughs> bountiful eye shall be blessed, <coughs> for he giveth of his bread to the poor. One who has a bountiful eye is one who is a benevolent person. They are unselfish. They're giving. Uh, they see the needs of others, and they want to be a help. This is one who gives. Notice, giveth his bread. They give from their own possessions. They don't take what belongs to someone else and then go give it to someone. They take from their own uh, possessions and they will share it with people that are in need. Those who uh, are uh, have this behavior in their life and, and live by this way, they will be blessed. God will bless them in his way. You'll never be one that can outgive God. He will bless you. It may not be materialistically speaking, but the Lord will bless us. Uh, giving, uh, and, and I don't mean to uh, get off of exactly what this is saying here, but uh, a little preaching here other than just teaching, you give materialistically speaking to people that are in need and God will bless you. But if you give of yourself sometimes to people to be there to help, maybe even people that uh, are not necessarily the, the nicest people to you or the people that maybe you normally wouldn't reach out to to help, 
uh, or even the people that you do, the people that are close to you, whoever it may be, you give of yourself to try to be a help to these people, try to, to give love to them and show them compassion, the Lord will bless you. He blesses that benevolent eye, that one that is giving of themselves. Verse number 10, cast out the scorner and contention shall go out. Yea, strife and reproach shall cease. The scorner, we remember that to be the arrogant mocker. The scorner causes strife, reproach, and contention. I can personally say I have saw great damage a scorner can do to a congregation of people. I've witnessed people come into a church, and at first they put on a front as if everything's wonderful. They're there, just uplift. They want to love everybody. But soon the facade fades away, and their true colors show. I believe that's the mark of a true scorner. They, they, they can't come in presenting themselves one way, and then they look to cause trouble. Uh, they see themselves as, as right, and they begin to, uh, to push everyone else down. Strife and contention starts to run throughout the entire congregation because of one. And Solomon says to cast them out. First of all, I think uh, Brother Jackson here has been doing some teaching, and he's mentioned before you let someone join a church, you should get to know them first. And that's the truth. Before you invite someone in to be a member of a church, we need to, to, to weed out the scorners. We need to make sure that they are there for the right reasons, that they love the Lord, they love the people. Also, we can pray the Lord to, to protect us and to remove scorners from our church. Uh, the Lord, the God's word gives us uh, direction even how to deal with those that may be members that cause trouble. A scorner may not just be in the church, though. No doubt you've worked with scorners. You may have scorners in the family that all they're going to do is push everybody down. They're going to they're going to push their agendas. They're going to uh, make fun of others. They're going to belittle your beliefs, and you may have them around. And as long as they're in your company, there's going to be strife. And so they we need to cast out a scorner, and the reproach will cease. Another application here, I believe, is for you and I to remember: don't do not be scorners. Maybe you get around someone that's that way, but you ha don't have to become that way. Uh, we should not be a mocking person. We should not see ourselves as better than everyone else. And we shouldn't be arrogant and be the one who causes strife when things are not going exactly like we should think they should. Uh, we need to keep ourselves from being that type of person. Verse number 11. He that loveth pureness of heart for the grace of his lips, the king shall be his friend. Those who love pureness of heart, they live by pureness of heart as well if they love it. They're kind, they're considerate. They do not only think of self. They show compassion to, to people uh, of all different types. They, uh, they seek to do what's right because they love pureness of heart. They want to keep their heart pure, so they seek to do what is right. This type of behavior, it's attractive. It attracts people. It will even be noticed by leaders. If I think of employers who have employees who just simply do what's right and do what they should be doing, it's noticed and it's rewarded. And that should be our life lived in our daily life. We should have that pureness of heart with everybody we interact with, with everything that we do in our life. And as employees, uh, we should do the same. And it will be rewarded. Verse number 12. The eyes of the Lord preserve knowledge. And he overthroweth the words of the transgressor. <coughs> God preserves knowledge. We know that he's preserved knowledge through his work, through the, through the Bible. And he also preserves those who glean in his knowledge. Proverbs 27, I believe it was verse 8. He layeth up sound wisdom for the righteous. He is a buckler to them that walk uprightly. He keepeth the paths of judgment and preserveth the way of his saints. Through his preservation, he preserves us. He preserves God's word. He preserves knowledge for us, but he also overthrows the transgressor. His truth always defeats transgressions and falsehoods. There's a lot of falsehood out there. The world's trying to destroy the truth of the word of God today, but no matter who it is, no matter what it is, no matter how many people come and try to twist the truth, God will always preserve the truth. It will always overthrow a lie. 
His word, his knowledge will always stand. Verse number 13. The slothful man saith, there is a lion without. I shall be slain in the streets. So here we see Solomon revisiting the lazy person. Uh, they will wake up with any excuse not to get out and work and do something and be busy. The thought of just putting forth the effort to labor, to get out and do something, to be productive in life, it's too much for them. They'll claim anything to get out of doing it. They'll say it's too cold. It's too hot. Uh, it, it's it's going to rain. It's too dry. They'll always be an excuse on and on. They will press on. They won't just press on and labor. They'll find a reason why they can't. Look at how our verse here, how they exaggerate situations. There's a lion without. I shall be slain in the streets. I'll be killed. It makes me think of excuses I've heard, just ridiculous excuses to not labor. I've heard so many things that people will use, and they'll use anything they can to get out of doing something. And the slothful will always have an excuse to lay up in their laziness. I've seen people with physical ailments get up and labor doing whatever they can without complaint. I've seen others who are very physically able, mentally able to do great things, but they always complain and have an excuse of why they can't do it. Let us not be excuse makers, but let us be doers. Verse 14. The mouth of strange women is a deep pit. He that is abhorred of the Lord shall fall therein. Remember the strange woman. It's been a little while uh, since we saw the strange woman pop up, but Solomon dealt with the strange woman many times earlier on. And if you remember, this is an immoral woman. It can be a harlot. It can be an estranged woman. Her mouth is a deep pit. So what's that saying? She will seduce with her words to draw you in. You think of this strange woman, you think uh, immediately, you think of sensual, sexual draw, and she will entice you to do something you should not be doing. Once she has you, you will fall in the deep pit of sin. It's so easy to fall into, and notice it's deep. You can fall in a little hole and get out. You fall in a deep pit, you may not be able to get out. It's going to be difficult to get out of the pit once you're in. And those who have a horde of the Lord, these are those who have turned away from God. They won't heed to his wisdom. They've, they've created a barrier there. They move far from him, and therefore he allows them to do so. He is not with them because they choose to deny him. They are those who lack wisdom. They lack discernment. They will be people that will fall into the deep pit with the enticing words of the strange woman. This is directed toward men falling for the strange woman, but women be aware. You can fall for the strange man as well. You can be enticed. And yes, those who deny God and follow self are more subject to falling in this strange woman's pit. But anyone who lets down their guard, anyone can be, a, it can be a saved person even that has turned their back on God. They've ran far away from God and, and, and they've fallen in this pit. I'll even say you can be serving God one moment. You'd be striving to live wisely and be the best uh, and do trying to do your best, but you need to be aware that these temptations of this world will still get a hold of you. We have multiple examples of people falling into the deep pit of sin, falling into the deep pit of sexual sin because they let their guard down and they put a barrier up between them and God. They couldn't discern what was happening and they allowed themselves to be seduced into sin and they fell into pits that created scars in their lives that had a lasting impact. And we need to be careful of that because sometimes if we fall too, too deep, it can be hard to overcome. Verse 15, <clears throat> foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction shall drive it far from him. Everyone in this world is born with a sin nature. As beautiful as those little babies are when they were born and as innocent as they are in their infancy, they have a sin nature that will eventually show itself. And children have it in them. Tell me this evening, if you have, if you had to ever teach your child to tell a lie, do you ever have to teach them to lie to you? No, because it was there. Do you ever have to teach them to hide things from you and to be deceptive? No, it, it was our, they, they did that on their own. You never had to teach it. Do you ever have to teach them to, hey, go take this thing that's not yours, that doesn't belong to you? You didn't have to teach that because 
the nature of sin within within all of us. You don't have to teach it to sin. It's there. And, and our flesh will guide us to do what's wrong. And that's the thing here with children. Sin will rear up in the life of a child as they age without it having to be taught because it's in their flesh. Now, on the on other side, you have to teach them to do what's right. You can't just assume they know to do the right thing without being taught. Wrong is natural, but doing right has to be taught. It has to be taught. Sometimes it will have to be even taught with correction. When, when a child does wrong, you have to correct them and show them how to do, do what's right. There has to be consequences for wrongdoing. We saw that uh, many times throughout the scripture already uh, uh, in adulthood, in, in governmental life. We saw where Solomon talks about the king that who, who uh, puts consequences upon wrongdoing and then therefore people quit doing what's wrong because they know there's consequences. Same thing with our children. They are born into sin. Let me reread the verse. Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child. It's there, but the rod of correction shall drive it far from him. Uh, so many people today, they laugh when their child does something wrong as if it's cute, as, when they're little children. They'll laugh at it. But that is teaching them to continue to do the wrong because they see that it pleases, it, it amuses. And we need to be careful of that. As much as it may hurt, we have to be firm and correct with wrong actions in our children. My children are, are still live at my house and they're aging and they're getting older and it hurts me when I have to correct them society today says let your children be free thinkers just let them be what they're going to be let them do what they're going to do don't tell them they're wrong because that'll crush their spirit you don't tell them they're wrong they're going to crush your spirit they're going to do wrong and they're going they're going to continue down that path and it's going to break your heart we need to tell them when they're wrong that is such foolish teaching to say let them do whatever they're going to do Look around what's going on in the world. It, it, we, we have these children that's never been taught right. Now they're adults and they still don't know the word no and they still don't know to do what's right. They don't understand because they've never been taught. It's damaged our homes. And since it's damaged our homes, who makes up our society? Families that live in homes. And so our society is damaged. We have to teach our children to do right and stop doing wrong. That there is a consequence and a punishment for wrongdoing. And it will drive them far from doing that wrong. I do want to draw attention real quickly here. It does say the rod of correction. Sometimes there's physical correction that's needed. And it helps to teach that wrong actions have to be dealt with. It's hard to administer. It's hard to, to, uh, to administer discipline under your children. It hurts. And, I, I, and I, it's often been said, and it's true, it hurts the parent more than the child but it has to be done so they get back on the right path. And so much more could be said about that, but I think you get what the word of God is saying. I'd love to spend more time on it, but we'll move on. Verse 16, he that oppresseth the poor to increase his riches and he that giveth to the rich shall surely come to want. There are people who will oppress the poor, the less fortunate for their own gain. They prey upon them. They take from them. You see it all over the world today in scams. So many scam artists, they seek out people who uh, are, are less fortunate, who are looking to try to find some way to, to, to rebound, to rise back up. And, and they'll even, uh, especially they'll attack elderly people who are living on uh, just a, a little bit of means of fixed income. And they scam them and take from them. Talk them into paying something uh, and they do not that they don't owe or paying something that they'll never get any gain from and they take from them. or maybe even a tradesman who finds a person who has little money to spend and gives them a low price um, lower than others to perform a job but they cut corners and they don't do the job uh, efficiently and effectively and it appears that everything looks really really great but in reality they didn't really take care of what needed to be done but they still take the person's money or others who may even take an upfront payment, but never show up and do the work. Then we see those who give to the rich mentioned here. Now, I can see a, a couple applications here, and I'll give them to you real quickly. Think of some large corporation uh, who give large bonuses to their executives for meeting certain financial uh, goals. And so these executives, all they're thinking about is themselves. They already make a lot of money, but they want this bonus. They want to gain more. 
And so they'll cut corners. They'll even maybe cut out things from their own employees, overwork their employees with no compensation, therefore earning the corporation more money and getting themselves a bonus. But they have they have taken from their own employees or they've not done exactly the right thing just so they can reach those goals. You can apply this even to giving bribes, as we've seen before, those in power, uh, giving money, giving means to those in power to get your own way. Those who do these things shall one day come to the place of want themselves when you're taking from the poor. They may take the, from the poor now. They may pad the pockets of the rich now for their own benefit, but this type of behavior will not pay off in the end. The next few verses here will continue the thought. I think all these will bind together, so we'll try to at least get through them. Verse uh, 17 through, through 21, we're going to read all those together. Bow down thine ear and hear the words of the wise and apply thine heart unto my knowledge. For it is a pleasant thing if thou keep them within thee, they shall be, they shall withal be fitted in thy lips, that they tr thy trust may be in the Lord. I have made known to thee this day, even to thee, have not I written to thee excellent things and counsels and knowledge that I might make thee know the certainty of the words of truth, that thou mightest answer the words of truth to them that sin unto thee. So <clears throat> as we continue, uh, th this these next few verses have a continuous thought together, uh, the 17 through 21. So we're going to bind them together. Bow here means to stretch out, to extend. So we should give attention to the words of the wise. Bow down that ear and hear the words of the wise. Pay close attention to what they have to say. Uh, we've already seen that the wise will use their tongue wisely. They may not always be speaking they might not always be saying something, but when they do share wisdom, we should give ear and listen. And then, uh, and apply thine heart into, thy, into my knowledge. That is to uh, apply is to set, to appoint, to fix our hearts uh, under the knowledge of the wise, of that godly wisdom that will be shared with us. Listen to it, accept it. And as we accept it, we have it there to put use in life. The wisdom we receive, it is pleasant to keep within us to have it there to guide our path. You may not need it immediately, but you may need it on tomorrow. And it's there. It should be stored up as we've saw before with wisdom and, and knowledge there to access when we need it. And keep godly knowledge and wisdom within us. It'll be united to our lips. We'll speak wisely and we will be able to share it with others at the right time. As we glean knowledge from the wise, later we will be able to speak it and share it with others. When we hear true wisdom, take heed to it, apply it in our lives. It'll move us to trust the Lord more. Our faith will grow in him. We'll be better and closer followers of Christ and we'll allow him to be the, our shepherd. The Lord gives us the truth. And when we apply godly knowledge and godly wisdom, we're applying the truth. We can have confidence and clarity in the truth of his word. God gives us true counsel and knowledge. He, it is there for us to glean from. He does so, so we can have access to know the truth. We can use it, apply it, as I've said before, and we can make it known to others, and we can use it to instruct ourselves and instruct other people. Let's go on to verse 22. Rob not the poor because he is poor. Neither oppress the afflicted in the gate. Now, we've seen this already, how the Lord feels about those who further oppress the poor. The poor should not be taken advantage of, some fall into poverty because of things out of their control. It just happens. Others may fall into poverty because of their own doings. They did something to cause it on their, uh, upon themselves. But either way, we shouldn't further push them down. We should not further uh, uh, make it harder on them and take advantage of them. The poor have a very little already, and we shouldn't try to take more from them and manipulate them. Also, the afflicted, should not be oppressed. They're already under affliction. They're already having a hard time and people are not to push them further down. I think sometimes that there, there's people that are drawn to that. They see somebody at a weak point and they want to continuously push upon them. At the gate, it gives us the idea of in a public place, publicly belittling the oppressed and making it harder for them in front of others. That's not behavior the Lord wants to see. This next verse continues the thought of the previous, I believe, Verse 23, for the Lord will plead their cause and spoil their soul of those spoil the soul of those that spoiled them. 
The Lord will not put up with the less fortunate being pushed down by other people. He will punish those who do so. If you remember Proverbs 17, verse 5, Whoso mocketh the poor reproacheth his maker, and he that is glad at calamity shall not be unpunished. Psalm 12, verse 5, For the oppression of the poor, for the sighing of the needy, now will I arise, saith the Lord. I will set him in safety from him that puffeth at him. Verse 24, Make no friendship with an angry man, and with a furious man thou shalt not go. And let me stop for a second. I gave you those Proverbs 17, 5, Proverbs 12, 5 to further show you what was going on there in verse 23. They go along with that oppression of the poor and the Lord, he doesn't put up with it. But back to 24. So make no friendship with an angry man and with a furious man thou shalt not go. Don't keep company with an angry man. Do not befriend them. Do not hang around them. Don't be around a furious man. Furious is a little step further. It's one that is, has a hot temper, a short fuse. And the Lord's telling us, stay clear of people like this. Don't go around them. Wisdom shared for you and I to avoid this type of person. They'll cause strife in your life. It's better to avoid them. You don't need that strife. There's further warning in verse 25, an explanation here, lest thou learn his ways and get a snare to thy soul. You hang around people like this, they're going to stir your emotions. And it can cause you to react toward them in a way you shouldn't. It'll cause you to become furious, angry as they are. Also, they may rub off on you. You might become like them and you may become an angry person. We tend to become like the people we keep company with. Oftentimes we think, well, I'll, I'll go hang around them. I can change them. But more, more often than not, if we begin to hang around people of certain character, we become like them. Oh, we lived there in Wales for those years. And we, we took on that nature, that culture that we lived around. We became different. And it's not a bad thing to um, understand that. But I'm just saying, where you, the, the people you're around, you become like them. Uh, and that's a cultural example. But say, say you, uh, you go hang around somebody that uh, enjoys sports. And that's all they talk about, all they think about. Before long, you're probably going to go, uh, can't talk, but going to become a sports fan. And I know those are light examples, but here the, uh, it has the same truth. God's warning us, don't go around angry people, furious people, because you're going to become like them. You're going to take on their characteristics. You can damage your spiritual life, so we need to stay clear of them. Let's look at verse, we, i tell you what, we got we don't have very much farther. We're going to try to finish this chapter. I know it's a little bit long but let's try to finish it up tonight. Verse 26, Be not thou one of them that strike hands or of them that are sureties for debts. Now I want to draw your attention back to Proverbs 6, 1. My son, if thou be surety for thy friend, if thou hast stricken thy hand with a stranger. If you remember that, that striking of hands means you're, uh, you're uh, to, to commit an agreement. It's like, come here, Cole, real quick. We'll use you again tonight. It's like me and Cole, we're making an agreement. And we shake hands. That, that shaking of hands bonds that agreement. We're tied together in an agreement. All right, you can sit down now. It, it's uh, saying you are committing yourself to a transaction. And that's committing yourself here is talking about being a surety for a debt. Another thing Solomon has talked about multiple times. And we are further warned not to stand good for a debt of someone else. Now, you shake hands of your own debt but whenever you become surety for someone else's debt, you're taking on their obligations. Verse 27 here says, if thou hast nothing to pay, why should he take away thy bed from under thee? It continues a little bit from the previous verse again. You'll find that when people could not pay their debts during, during these times, that other property could be taken from them. Uh, they could even be forced into servanthood to repay their debt. And in today's time, when you become surety for someone, you commit to that, uh, the payment of that debt is going to fall on you. You're going to become responsible for it if they don't pay it. And if you have no means to pay that, if you're saying, well, all I got to do is put my name down and that'll help them, you're forgetting that that debt, if they don't pay, it's going to fall on you and you don't even have the means to pay it back. It could be that you're taken to court you lose your property for something you don't even have, for a debt that wasn't even yours, but you became surety for it. You may have financial ruin in your life. Everything you own, everything you've worked for could be taken from. So we need to be careful. 
of being a surety. Verse 28, remove not the ancient landmark which thy fathers have set. Now this, again, this could draw out more, but we'll just try to give you what he's saying here quickly. Think about the time this was written. We always want to remember that in some of these applications. Uh, this is speaking of property. Do not remove the ancient landmark, property boundaries. Do not part with the land, the, the, the property that your fathers have left you. If you think back, Naboth was approached by Ahab wanting his vineyard, but Naboth refused to let go of his inheritance. God forbid it me. Now, Deuteronomy 27, 17 tells us this, cursed be he that removeth his neighbor's landmark and all the people shall say amen. So the land, the inheritance was so important at this time. So how can we apply this? We're thinking about these landmarks. These, again, let me, let me reemphasize. This is things that have been passed down. Uh, we know the Israelite land, and, and we talk about Naboth, and it's been passed down. And don't part with that. Don't remove the landmarks. Keep what's been handed down to you from your forefathers. Now, applying it today, and I'm spiritually speaking, do not remove the truths that's been handed down to us. The word of God, that landmark given to us, don't remove it. Don't fall into false doctrine. Don't fall away from God's word. Stand for it. Live by it. I, I, I preached last night on, on the importance of us being obedient to God's word. No matter what our feelings are, no matter which way we want to go, being obedient and, and walking as we ought to walk. And we, we need to hold on to that. Live by it. Never try to change God's word into fitting what we want it to say. The privilege to attend church. We should protect that. Be faithful to it. People died for our freedom to be able to worship God. People not only, even our, 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 our go back in history of just, just fighting for our natural freedoms where we could attend church. But if you go even further back, those that died, that gave their life for the gospel, for the truth of God's word. And it's been handed down to us and we have it. We should protect it. Walking in truth without compromise. The church has always stood for truth and it should continue to do so without compromise or falsehoods. Whoever may come by the way of Horror Baptist Chapel and want to change things, we should always be people that will stand and say, no, you're not changing. it. We're standing for what's right. And it should continue. We should continue to do so without compromise. In our individual lives, we shouldn't compromise just because the world says, okay, this is the way it is now. We should strive to look like, talk like, and live like godly men and women. And that is, is fading away in the day we live. Our minds and our feelings want to drive us. And it's more evident today than it's ever been because we live in a world where, who lets their feelings and, and, and their, their minds guide them. They wear their feelings on their shoulders. We just need to be men and women and do what's right. Stand on what's been passed down unto us. Again, that's so much more can be said, but let's try to finish. Seeing that, verse 29, seest thou a man diligent in his business, he shall stand before kings. He shall not stand before mean men. Here's another financial look here, a business look. And I love the practical and spiritual truths in the word of, uh, in the book of Proverbs. Diligent here, it's, it means to be quick, prompt, ready. We know being diligent means uh, it's someone ready to work for their business, ready to get the job done faithful to laboring and laboring in the right way. They work toward success. They work toward good moral dealings. They, 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 they try to do what's right in their business, in their way of life, and it will be noticed. Hard work and right dealings will be noticed. It says he'll stand before kings. <clears throat> People in authority will see their diligence. They'll be commended and maybe even join in a business with them. He shall not stand, excuse me, before mean men. The word mean here is, we know, we know what in general the word mean is, but if you do a word study here, it means dark, but it also means insignificant. 
Those who work hard and conduct themselves right in business and in life, they'll rise above the insignificant and be recognized by great authorities. This applies practically as we work hard and conduct ourselves right. We'll be rewarded for that. But I think about it spiritually. One day, Brother Alvin, we're going to stand before the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, Jesus Christ. And we're going to be judged on our works, on how we conducted ourselves as saved individuals on this earth. Did we did we run off by the way we felt? Did we try to do things the, uh, uh, upon our own mind, our own thoughts? And did we just go out and, and labor uh, uh, without, without uh, uh, seeking God and, and doing it the way God wants us to do and, and conduct ourselves in other ways? Or did we stand upon God's word, live by it, work according to what God's word said, conduct ourselves according to what God's word says? And those who were diligent and busy living by the word of God, being uh, laborsome in the word of God, I believe the Lord will reward them for what they do. Lord, thank you for the good study tonight. Thank you for your word that we can apply to our lives. Pray you be with us as we move forward into our time of prayer. In Jesus' name, amen.